Congestive heart failure, or CHF, is a complex syndrome that can result from any functional cardiac disorder that impairs the filling or ejection ability of the ventricles. Congestive heart failure is present in approximately 5 million people in the United States. In this animation, we will review the pathophysiology of CHF. We will also highlight the mechanism of action of digoxin. Let's take a closer look at the heart. Take a moment to identify the various anatomical structures. We are looking at a representation of the normal function of the heart. Notice how blood leaves the ventricles with each contraction. A variety of conditions can predispose to CHF, including myocardial infarction, hypertension, valvular heart disease, cardiomyopathy, and amyloidosis. The pathologic changes caused by these conditions lead to decreased contractility and subsequently decreased cardiac output. This will cause a reduction in blood pressure. In response to the decrease in blood pressure, the body tries to compensate through the activation of the sympathetic nervous system and the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Let's review the activation of each one of these systems in detail. Let's start with the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Postganglionic neurons of the sympathetic nervous system release norepinephrine into the bloodstream. Norepinephrine then binds to alpha-1 receptors of blood vessels to produce systemic arterial vasoconstriction in an attempt to maintain blood pressure and tissue perfusion. This will increase afterload, placing further strain on the heart. Norepinephrine also acts on beta-1 receptors in the heart, increasing both its contractility and rate. Initially, this helps to maintain the cardiac output. However, in the long term, it increases the amount of work the heart has to perform. To counteract these effects of norepinephrine, beta blockers are used in the treatment of CHF. We will now review the activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system in response to reduced blood pressure. Let's take a closer look at the kidney. A decrease in blood pressure results in a reduced perfusion to the kidneys. This reduces the tension within the wall of afferent arterioles, which stimulates renin release from juxtaglomerular cells. Renin release is also stimulated by increased sympathetic activity. After its release, renin circulates through the bloodstream, where it converts angiotensinogen, synthesized by the liver, to generate angiotensin 1. In the lungs, angiotensin 1 is converted by angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE, into angiotensin 2, which then travels to the peripheral arterioles. Let's zoom in on a peripheral arteriole. Angiotensin II binds to its receptors in the blood vessels, causing vasoconstriction. This increases the total peripheral resistance, which in turn raises the systemic blood pressure and increases afterload. We will now review the action of angiotensin II on the adrenal gland. Let's zoom in on the adrenal gland and look more closely at the zona glomerulosa. Angiotensin II travels through the circulation to the zona glomerulosa. Here, it stimulates the synthesis and the release of aldosterone. 
aldosterone then circulates through the bloodstream to the kidneys. Finally, it reaches the principal cells of collecting ducts. Here, aldosterone binds to its receptors, increasing reabsorption of sodium and the excretion of potassium. This will increase blood volume, therefore raising blood pressure. This produces fluid overload that further increases the burden on the heart. ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are used in the treatment of CHF since they decrease the effects of angiotensin II. Let's now summarize the effects of these compensatory processes on the heart. The increased afterload caused by the increased activity of both circulating catecholamines and the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system amplifies the amount of work the left ventricle has to perform. In response, the left ventricle develops pressure overload hypertrophy, which is concentric. In contrast, volume overload causes ventricular dilation. This occurs in response to excess angiotensin II and aldosterone production. This myocardium remodeling leads to left ventricular failure. Since the heart is not ejecting enough blood, the end systolic volume will be abnormally elevated. This will increase the pressure within the ventricle. This increase in pressure backs up to the left atrium, then the pulmonary veins, and further to the lungs. The increased pulmonary capillary pressure favors fluid extravasation, causing pulmonary edema, which impairs ventilation. This pathogenesis explains why left-sided heart failure presents with respiratory symptoms such as cough, shortness of breath, and orthopnea. On auscultation, there will be rails and an S3 gallop due to fluid overload illustrated here as an increase in end systolic volume in the left ventricle. To reduce fluid overload, loop diuretics can be used in the treatment of CHF. The increased back pressure in the lungs progresses to the pulmonary artery and then to the right ventricle. The resulting increase in pulmonary vascular resistance eventually intensifies the amount of work the right ventricle must perform. This results in right ventricular failure. As the end systolic volume rises, the pressure within the right ventricle increases even further. This eventually leads to an increased pressure within the right atrium. This increased pressure extends to the superior vena cava and the jugular veins. The increased pressure within the jugular veins presents as jugular venous distension, or JVD. The pressure also extends into the inferior vena cava. This produces chronic passive congestion of the liver, resulting in hepatomegaly. The increased pressure in the systemic venous system results in fluid extravasation, producing peripheral edema. The edema usually begins in the ankles where the venous pressure is high due to gravity and is referred to as pedal edema. It can also manifest within the abdomen where excess fluid results in ascites. We will now summarize the major signs and symptoms of CHF. Left ventricular failure usually presents with shortness of breath, orthopnea, and pulmonary edema, whereas right ventricular failure presents with JVD, hepatomegaly, ascites, and peripheral edema. Since both ventricles are usually affected, a combination of symptoms of both left and right heart failure will be seen. Now, digoxin is used in the management of CHF due to its ionotropic effect. 
It can also be used in certain arrhythmias due to its negative chronotropic effect. Let's take a closer look and discuss the mechanism of action of digoxin. First, let's review the physiology. In myocytes, the sodium-potassium ATPase pump exchanges three sodium ions for every two potassium ions. This creates low intracellular sodium concentration. Due to the low sodium concentration inside the cell, there will be sodium influx in exchange for calcium through the sodium-calcium exchanger. Calcium enters the cell following its concentration gradient through its own channels. Digoxin works by inhibiting sodium-potassium ATPase pumps of cardiac myocytes. This increases the intracellular sodium concentration, which explains the proarrhythmic side effect of digoxin. Digoxin decreases the sodium concentration gradient and the subsequent calcium outflow through the sodium-calcium exchanger. This results in increased calcium concentration intracellularly. This leads to increased contractility, which increases heart efficiency. The effects of digoxin can be seen on the EKG. On the top, a normal EKG is shown. The EKG of a patient taking digoxin may show nonspecific ST segment depressions with a scooped appearance as shown in the lower EKG. Note, however, that specific EKG findings of digoxin can be seen with therapeutic levels and are not necessarily signs of toxicity.